what happened is when Lena Frederick and I started Walter Carrington School in 1975, very early on we were invited uh, by students of Peter Scott's school, he was ran a training school at that time in Ealing, to a party with all the uh, trainees from Patrick McDonald's school and Dr. Barlow and Marjorie Barlow's school and the Carringtons. And I thought this was going to be great, I could meet other trainees and so on. And then what happened is that we showed up and you had the McDonald people in one corner of the room, the Barlow people in the other, Carrington in another corner of the room, and then we were all trying to go around, you know, the Peter Scott people were trying to go around and make it all work. And, uh, you know, it, it just was very obvious to me the, the, how painful it was. So, a little while later, I wanted to make a film on the Alexander Technique. So there's a gentleman from San Francisco named Bob O'Dell and his wife Ruth O'Dell who were very well off financially and they loved the Alexander Technique and working with Walter Carrington. And they gave me $20,000 and in, in early 1980 money, that was, that was a lot of bucks, to, to uh, uh, do this film. And so I hired a man named Joel Geyer to uh, a director of, of PBS to go around interviewing the Barlows and Patrick and the Carringtons and Marge Barstow in Lincoln, Nebraska, about a film. And he came back and he said that there wasn't enough what he called hard science to warrant making this project because he wanted to do it for Nova. But he said what you need to do is an international congress. And when he told me this, we were having a meal in Lincoln, Nebraska with Marge Barstow. So I turned to Marge and I said, if I organize International Congress, would you be there? And she said, yes. It wasn't, it wasn't like I thought I could do it. It wasn't, it was as if it needed to be done and I saw it needed to be done and I reflected back on that party 10 years earlier mm -hmm. when I was beginning my training with Walter and here the idea was being presented. It was, it was as if you know, the sky opened up and this wonderful idea that time was right and then I just said, run with it. So I didn't think in terms of it wouldn't work. To me, it seemed like it will work, you just had to take action. That's how I approached it. The moment I could drive, mm -hmm. I, near where I grew up there was this lovely resort called Lake Geneva, Wisconsin. And the moment I could drive, I went up there and there were little groups of people all around the lake, but I had the knack of making friends with all the groups. I knew more people around Lake Geneva than anyone else. So I had this ability to, to enter into other people's thinking and social structure and be accepted. And when I lived in London, as you remember in the 70s, all the old guard were very much alive and very vital with their training schools. And I would go and meet the people. I remember being uh, that Dr. Barlow was going to give a slideshow, a presentation, an introduction to the Alexander work. Lena and I showed up and I was there early and I saw him get out of a cab struggling with his slideshow equipment. I went up and said, Dr. Barlow, my name is Michael Frederick. I'm training as an Alexander teacher. May I help you carry your equipment in? And he said, sure. And that meant I got to sit next to him mm -hmm. because I set up the equipment. And I did that a couple times, and he got, you know, he, he trusted me a little bit. And then Marjorie Barlow, I, I got to know, and uh, she liked me. And then, you know, Walter and Dillis, I, I, four years at the Carringtons, lived there at their home for two years. And then Marge Barstow, I met around 1980. Actually, I met her earlier than that, but I really got to know her around 1980. And she liked me, so I figured... And what about... Patrick McDonald. Patrick, yeah, I, I used to go visit his school. I mean, I like Patrick immensely. Sure, sure, but he was so you, a great guy. So in other words, what you're saying is you develop rapport with all of these seniors. I had all that in my in my background when it was around 1985 when I had this meal, 84, 85 with Joel Geyer. How did you actually recruit? All well, the other I figured. Well, this the is how I'll tell you exactly how it worked. <laughs> I figured I had Walter and Dillis in my hip pocket because I trained with them and I knew they liked me. So I thought the hard person would probably be Patrick. So 
I write off letters to all of them. Lo and behold, Patrick said, yes, right away. And I was floored. And then I got a yes from Marjorie Barlow, but not from Bill Barlow. Mm -hmm. And Walter said to me, and I could not believe it, he said, well, I'm not going to come unless Bill comes. Mm -hmm. I was flabbergasted because I thought for sure Walter would give a go because he was such a positive person. But no, he wasn't going to come unless Dr. Wilfred Barlow showed up. So I actually talked to Marjorie Barlow. I said, Marjorie, you got to do a little (laughs) pillow talk with Bill. (laughs) And she laughed and she said, I'll work on him. And she did. And Bill uh, sent me a letter and said, I will be there. And so I remember then thinking, oh, it's all set up. So I called up Walter at Lansdowne Road. And he, he was teaching, so I left the message with his secretary, and I said, please tell Walter that Dr. Barlow has agreed to come to the Congress in 1986. And I thought, fine. In the middle of the night, I'm telling you, that night, around 4.30 a.m., my phone rings. I reach over and get it, hoping it's not bad news, and I pick up and say, hello, this is Michael. And on the other end of the line, hi, Michael, this is Walter. I'm coming. Bye. <laughs> now, that was very non-Walter. Usually, Walter was this magnanimous person who would spend any amount sure. of time with you. But, you know, he played his card and I played my card and he had to show up because, you know, he was a man of his words. So, yes. And then I worried. You know, I thought, oh my God, they're all coming. What happens here? Be careful what you, what you wish <laughs> Exactly. For. Now they're so, all coming. So, so how, how did you, why did you choose the place that you chose, the right. time that you chose, and what was your strategy for making this a successful event? Because I was at the first Yeah, course, sure. Course, and it was fabulous. It was, right. ama- it was miraculous. Yeah. It, was a, it was a miracle. <laughs> Hallelujah. How did you pull it off? Well, the thing is, first I had to find a facility. And so I forgot how I actually connected up with Stony Brook University on Long Island near New York City, but we found the facility and it seemed suitable. Get them off their home turf Mm -hmm. and get them in a new environment. And I picked New York because it was actually an easier flight from London. Mm -hmm. And I knew that Marge Barstow in Lincoln, Nebraska would be willing to go to New York Mm because she said she would. So I found uh, Stony Brook University. And then I was worried that they would all not get on. So I went to great pains to find beautiful facilities around Stony Brook. So I found, uh, uh, you know, hotels and inns where I put uh, Patrick in one. I put Dr. Barlow and Marjorie Barlow in another hotel, a very nice one on their own. And then Walter Carrington and Dillis and Marge Barstow, I knew would get on. So I put them in the same inn. In, in Stony Brook. Uh, and then I had drivers for all of them and really treated them like kings and queens. It was, it was a great experience. They all came together. And in hindsight, the, the truth is, they were so generous to each other. It, it, it almost brought tears to my eyes. I mean, there was no animosity. They were gracious. Dr. Barlow joked with Walter. We had wonderful meals. You know, Marjorie Barlow was there. I remember Patrick seeing Marge Barstow after decades and decades and going and saying, oh, my dear, you had the best hands of any of us. It's so wonderful to see you. How sweet. And they worked together. I, I have photos someplace if I, of Marge Barstow and Patrick going into a room just by themselves, and the only other people in the room were myself, Frank Ottawell, and a photographer. And they worked with each other, and it was humbling watching it. That's I mean, they were so kind to each other. Mm. And then that moment when they first walked on stage, I mean, my God, in our little Alexander world, it was like having Jesus, Rock Mohammed, yeah, cool. Mohammed I, the, <laughs> the Buddha, and Zoriaster all up on stage together. It was a breathtaking moment. So, so, looking back, what were the highlights, and what were the major lessons that you learned in terms of how to set the stage for even more effective future congresses? Well, one, if I became afraid watching my own fear when I organized something, because I would see that that was a limiting factor. So I would work on myself that way. The other thing 
is to realize that we have in the Alexander work something very, very special. And that basically, from a collective, we're a great group of people. People love the work. So even though I found that, you know, people would go in their little corners and maybe bitch a little bit about, about teaching modality of someone else. But when push came to shove, there was agreement. And that's what I witnessed. And as the years went by, I mean, now we're on our 10th Congress. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's traveled all over the world. We're going to have one. So you just, in other words, yeah. you emphasized the common values. Absolutely. And, and the common heritage. Yeah. And right. And respected the differences, but I didn't mm -hmm. put a spotlight on them. Mm -hmm. Great. And what occurred is that it, it worked. And then you would get all these people coming together from all over the world who had a similar uh, love of the technique. And then they started mingling and, and learning from each other. And it was just a very, very rich atmosphere. And you captured this on film. Or That's right. Yeah, I call it the missing dead sea, sea scrolls in the Alexander world. You know, I filmed, I, I made no money on the first Congress. What I did is I spent all the extra money. It was over about ten to $12,000, which again was a lot of money to me, filming it. And I had this professional PBS crew come, uh, and uh, th there was a, a, a camera person, a sound person, and a director, and, and they filmed it on state-of-the-art equipment of the time, and, I, and it's all there. It's never been seen. So you're, uh, master classes so of all the senior teachers. you edited this, put it all together, and people can actually get access to right. it? Right. Well, what we decided to do was not even edit it very much. We wanted, because there's sort of a stream of learning that goes mm -hmm. on. So you can watch a class of, of Marjorie Barlow for you know an hour, hour and a half, or, or Marge Barstow giving a master class. That's fantastic. Or, so yeah. How, so how, how much material do you have? Oh, and hours. Is it all available? Can, it will can all, be, all be available. I want to make this? it. What do you do there? Well, I, mean, I would like to have well, a copy sure. of that. Well, sure. Exactly. What I'm going to do is uh, there's a gentleman in in England named David Reed, who has a, uh, a film company, and he's going to uh, take our interview right now and put it at the beginning of, of a whole set of, of the whole Congress, and we're just going to have, make it available, sell it to everyone, and try to do it at an extremely reasonable price and, and make it work for people. When, when's it going to be ready? Well, I want it to be ready by uh, this coming, well, right now it's 2010, turning into 2011 in about a week. So I want it to uh, be ready by next summer when we're in Lugano, Switzerland for the Congress. And then I want just for it to be out there. I don't want to hold on to it. It really uh, needs to be for the community and, and a real learning uh, tool. Sign me up. Ah, okay. Thank you, my friend. Take care. Great.